Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the UCSD Economics Roundtable. I'm Jim Hamilton, Professor of Economics at UCSD. And uh, we have a really great event planned for today that we will be recording. In fact, we already started recording. Uh, and uh, we hope to make it available on YouTube after uh, the event. Uh, please use the chat button, which you can find by mousing around on your screen if you have any questions, and then we'll try to call on you when we get to the Q&A session a little bit later. Uh, I do expect today's topic is going to generate a lot of interest in discussion. And although we'll end the event promptly at 9, uh, we'll stay around for a more freewheeling chat or discussion. Uh, in the past, we've tried to use breakout rooms for that. We try something different today, just one big, happy, chaotic family, see if it works. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, I, I, I do think there's going to be some interesting discussion. But before I introduce today's uh, speaker and topic, uh, let me remind you about our upcoming events. We will be staying with Zoom for the rest of the calendar year 2021. Uh, we have some great events planned. Uh, everybody's talking about cryptocurrency these days. Uh, maybe you saw yesterday's news. El Salvador is going to start accepting Bitcoin for legal tender, which I think means you can pay your taxes with uh, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, what's that going to mean for currencies around the world and, and U.S. monetary policy? Uh, on um, Tuesday, September 7, uh, we have one of the uh, uh, world's leading academic researchers on these questions, uh, Linda Schilling from the Center for Research uh, in Economics and Statistics in Paris. Uh, I think that's going to be a great event that uh, be very informative for all of us. Uh, also, maybe you notice this week's news, uh, the San Diego Association of Government is proposing a $160 billion investment in uh, San Diego uh, transportation infrastructure. That's $160 billion with a, a B. Uh, so what is the future of transportation? What should it be in San Diego, in California, in the world? Uh, is the internal combustion engine going to be a thing of the past? On Tuesday, November 16th, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from UCSD Professor Mark Jacobson uh, to help us uh, think through some of those issues and, and look uh, uh, at where we might be going. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank our steering committee who helped guide our program. It's Don Billings, Jeff Lewin, Joe Marshall, Terry Moore, Alan Nevin, John Reese, uh, Vanessa Violetsko, and Manny Labrinos. And if you have any uh, suggestions for speakers or topics you'd like to see uh, next year, please bring those suggestions up to uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the members of the steering committee or, or to me. Uh, we also take this opportunity to thank our corporate sponsor, which is the CFA Society, and also our table sponsors, California Western School of Law, Terry Moore, Reese Investment Management, Sullivan Hill, and Expera Group. Uh, and now for today's uh, speaker. Uh, John Cochran is the Rosemarie and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He previously was Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago and President of the American Finance Association. Uh, he's an elected fellow of the Econometric Society, recipient of the TIAA Paul Samuelson Award, and many, many on other honors. I could I go on all morning about this. His, it, your graduate text on the asset pricing, John, is, is a work of beauty. And, and I recommend it to all graduate students as a place to start to understand what modern finance theory uh, is all about. Um, he also writes a, a wonderfully engaging and energetic blog, just as he's, you'll see, wonderfully engaging and energetic himself. He calls it the Grumpy Economist. Uh, you can also hear his thoughts in the Wall Street Journal, uh, many other venues, uh, including right here, uh, right now. Uh, he's going to share his thoughts today on where the Federal Reserve is uh, taking us uh, as the Federal Reserve uh, moves its sights to global warming and social justice. Uh, what about the U.S. economy? Is it overheating uh, and about to go off the rails? Uh, well, to help us find out, here is uh, Professor John Cochran. Uh, thank you for that lovely uh, and flattering introduction, Jim. It's a, a real pleasure to talk to you on Too Bad. I, I always enjoy my trips to San Diego, so it's too bad we can't do that this time, but but maybe next time. Um, so uh, let's get to it. Um, 
I was going to talk about the Fed, but I, uh, given the events of last week, I think I'll shade my comments a little more towards uh, the, the current news inflation, which of course has a lot to do with the Fed. So we'll start with thinking about inflation and then uh, move on to more generally what's going on uh, with the Federal Reserve. Um, so uh, in case you're uh, sleeping under a rock somewhere, we've had a couple of months of really sharp increases in inflation. And that's uh, bringing about all sorts of commentary, trying to understand what it is. Uh, as, as typical, our, uh, the Federal Reserve and, and other leaders say this is a transitory phenomenon. And uh, it doesn't take an economics PhD to figure out what's going on. There's a huge amount of pent up demand. People have a lot of money, they wanna spend it. We have uh, some supply constraints. You've, you've read about bottleneck shortages here and there. A lot of labor market uh, stuff, um, you know, people who are being paid to stay home tend not to go to work too quickly. There's a, a lot of reallocation that's needed. Uh, people need to move to new jobs from old jobs. So, you know, demand's more than supply. Prices are going up, duh, not too hard. The question is, uh, how long will this last? Is this just a hiccup as we get going and reopen the post-pandemic economy? Or are we building in uh, a, a serious beginning of, of new inflation? And for that, we have to think about how will the Fed react? Uh, what, what's, so are, are we, is this a new boom, off we go? <clears throat> or is this just a once in a time transitory hiccup? Well, that, that depends a lot on uh, what you think the Federal Reserve is gonna do uh, in reaction to these events. Now, uh, uh, along the way, in the last year, the Fed has adopted a new uh, comprehensive strategy, adopted an announced one. So um, if you wanna understand what the Fed's gonna do, we have to think about their new strategy and understand what they've said they're gonna do. So here I have uh, a little hist history. Uh, by the way, my first graph, I, I, this is the level of prices, not the growth rate as usually done. And I did it this way so you could see, prices went down in the pandemic, came back up again, and grew slowly for a little while. And now we've got this, this big thing. By looking at the level, I think we get away from all these base year controversies and so forth. You can see we, we, the prices recovered uh, last December from, from the pandemic. Uh, so what's happening now is genuinely something new and different, not just recovery uh, from the pandemic. So back to what, what, what happened with the Fed. Um, this is the history of unemployment as it slowly came down after the last recession. Uh, inflation, which batted along around 2%, as it always seemed to do. Uh, those of us who study inflation uh, uh, um, are, are, in some sense, almost a little heartened. Uh, I've been advised, stop studying inflation. It's always 2%. There's nothing to do here. So the fact that inflation is back on the agenda and we could talk some economics about it, yay! <laughs> I mean from the point of view of the country, no, but from the point of view of my own research program, I'm delighted to be back in, in, the, in relevance. Anyway, what happened was um, the Fed saw unemployment coming down, uh, way down. Unemployment was, uh, was remarkably low and started worrying, well, the economy might be getting ready to overheat. It's time to raise interest rates so that we don't get future inflation. Uh, and then uh, there was no future inflation. Now, this is really puzzling. If I were in charge of the Fed right about here, February uh, 2020, unemployment was at a historic low. Unemployment among minorities, disadvantaged, and the rest was even more at historic lows. Inflation was under 2%. I had just raised interest rates to stop inflation from rising, uh, and inflation didn't rise. I would have said, hooray! Mission accomplished, uh, you know, look how wonderful we are. The Fed didn't take it that way. <laughs> the Fed sort of regarded this as a grand failure that there wasn't inflation that they had headed off. And that and other things provoked a, a, a rather deep reaching change in strategy. So how does the Fed see its job anymore? The Fed is not going to uh, announce as it will not um, uh, tighten because it sees uh, expected inflation in the future. It's going to wait until actual inflation shows up until it does anything. Furthermore, <coughs> it's going to allow inflation to, to bubble higher than it's to, or it announces it plans to let inflation uh, be quite above its target and for quite a while before it does anything about it. It announced a, a quite different view uh, ever since uh, Jim and I were in graduate school uh, together a long, long time ago. <laughs> The, uh, the, we had changed from the 1960s view on the top to the 1970s view. In the, in the 1960s, 
people thought that the economy was subject to recessions and the job of the Fed was it was possible and desirable to always keep us uh, at, at the peaks, to fill the valleys. Uh, in the 1970s, um, we sort of changed view that no, economies could overheat as they did in the 1970s. Uh, and the job of the Fed was to keep the, uh, to, to stabilize the economy, neither to overheat nor underheat. And if you wanted higher growth, that wasn't the job of the Federal Reserve. That comes from productivity, supply, and so forth. The Fed is going back to the top view, that its job is to, to uh, that, that there really isn't such a thing as overheating and that it wants to, uh, to fill all short, shortfalls. Uh, the Fed is also um, now much more interested in inequality. Uh, inclusive growth is the buzzword. Uh, and it has uh, announced that it wants to let inflation uh, be higher for a while, in particular to drive down unemployment of, of disadvantaged uh, groups. The Fed um, uh, put a great deal of, of faith in the idea that promising that it would keep interest rates low for a long time in the future would stimulate the economy today. So you saw over the last two years, uh, the Fed saying, we not only are interest rates low, we're gonna keep them low, we're gonna keep them low for years, even if we don't feel like it afterwards. And I think the Fed is going to greatly regret those promises because now if it has to, if we see inflation and they have to raise interest rates quickly, they're going to feel, what about all these promises of low forever? Now, this sounds like a, you would think this is a, a formal framework. In fact, there's a lot of words here <laughs> and it's, it's fairly vague and complex enough that in fact, the Fed can do pretty much what it wants. Uh, discretionary policy is, is what we call that. Now, all of this, looks uh, a lot like the 1970s. And I think that's, if we think about the Fed's reaction, a worry is that we are going back to the policies that didn't work in the 1970s. And I realized preparing this, the 1970s are, are um, uh, I, I still remember them, uh, Jim still remembers them, but I remember being in graduate school with Jim and our professors were going on and on about the Great Depression. And, and I was, yeah, you know, that was kind of bad. And I remember the Dorothea Lange pictures and yeah, you know, but it was 1935, you know, I wasn't even born then. And I realized of course that to most economists today, now that I am aging the 1970s <laughs> are ancient history from before they were born. And they go, yeah, yeah, inflation, bell bottom jeans, long hair. Uh, but in fact, this is a, a relevant economic history. And so let me remind you what happened in the 1970s and the extent to which the conceptual framework I see at the Fed is, is very similar to what they had in the 1970s. So we start back in the 1960s, and there was a view uh, of most very prominent economists uh, that there was a trade-off, I made a little graph here, trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And they saw this pattern in the data, and they said they saw that black line in the data. So look, why don't we just run inflation a little higher and unemployment will go down? Um, especially among disadvantaged groups. Does that sound familiar? Um, well, the lesson of the 19th century, they, they did it. <laughs> they tried it, a little more inflation. Uh, and the lesson of the 1970s was that this was a correlation, but not a, a deep, uh, not a deep structure of the economy. When they tried it, they moved up to the inflation. And what happened is the whole thing took off to the top, top right. Um, what we got was more of both. And the big lesson, at least as taught in graduate school in the 1980s <laughs> and to this day, is that there is no permanent trade-off between unemployment and inflation. You can goose the economy for a little while, but you cannot permanently lower uh, unemployment. If you want permanently lower unemployment, especially among disadvantaged and so forth, that's the job of microeconomics. That's the job of flexible labor markets, reasonable regulation, reasonable tax rates, uh, education, so on and so forth, not of, of monetary policy. The 1970s, uh, also what happened was the Fed uh, waited to see inflation and allowed the economy to run hot for a while. And every time there was inflation, there was uh, an artful of uh, explanations from the Fed about how this was transitory supply factors, particular markets, blah, 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 and it'll go away. And I put the graph up here just to remind you a little bit of the history of inflation. Now, uh, follow with me. Uh, black is unemployment. So you see the recessions, boom, boom, and the huge recession of 1980 and 1982. 
Uh, red is inflation, and you can see how inflation ratcheted up. Uh, here is big inflation during the recession, stagflation, uh, three big waves of inflation. And in the blue, you see the interest rates, what the Fed was doing. Now, it looks like as inflation goes up, interest rates are going up, doesn't it? Uh, let's look particularly at 1974. But what counts to the economy is the difference between the interest rate and inflation, the, the real rate of interest, what I graphed here in, in green, how much is the uh, nominal rate greater than inflation? That's what, what uh, it affects the economy. So you can see that in 1972 to 74, yes, the Fed is raising interest rates with inflation, but barely keeping up. And then when a recession broke out, they gave up quickly and, and lowered the interest rate, um, sowing the seeds for more inflation, particularly in the late 1970s. Yes, they're raising interest rates as inflation goes up, but they're slow to it. They're waiting to see the inflation before they really do anything about it. The result of all this was, was uh, in the conventional story, what uh, the, the 1980, uh, 82 in particular, when interest rates went to 20%, caused a massive recession, but that's what it took to get rid of uh, inflation and a decade of high interest rates in order to squeeze that inflation out again. So that's the standard story of the, those are the facts, in fact. What did we learn from all that? What we learned was that expectations matter. Um, when, and, and I put this in bold face. Uh, so stop, wake up. <laughs> the one, concept, one of two conceptual things I hope you come away from is I, I think consensus without, throughout economics, the dynamics of inflation is inflation equals expected inflation plus whatever pressure you have. Now the pressure, it's not unemployment anymore. Uh, the Phillips curve doesn't really work, but whether you think of it as money or fiscal policy or whatever, it's moving inflation around. The way it affects inflation is through inflation equals expected inflation plus that pressure. And this is perfectly sensible. Uh, if you're running a business and you expect a lot of inflation next year, you're gonna be quicker to raise your prices this year. If you're, uh, if you're buying stuff and you expect a lot of inflation next year and the business says, hey, the price is higher, you're gonna be willing to pay it now because you know prices will be higher next year anyway. Uh, why go shopping? Why, why push hard about it? So uh, when, when expected inflation in the future goes up, that embeds inflation today above and beyond whatever pressure is. And now you see, this is the central lesson. Are we headed for inflation, uh, persistent inflation or not? If uh, the today's pressure, today's obvious demand more than supply uh, fades away, inflation will fade away so long as people believe that inflation over the long run will stick at 2%. If people start to believe that inflation will rise as they did in, 70, in 74 and 79, then you got a mess on your hands because then uh, you're, you're at a higher level. If people believe 5%, then the zero pressure point is 5%. And, and getting rid of it requires getting rid of those expectations. So the Fed knows this. And the Fed answers, well, don't worry. Um, expected inflate expectations are anchored. And they keep saying this, anchored. And I go, anchored by what? And basically by lovely speeches we give saying how much expectations are anchored? Because I can never get an answer to that question. Well, there's a little bit of an answer. Uh, if inflation breaks out, we have the tools to do about it. What tools? What exactly are you going to do if inflation breaks out and if ex expected inflation breaks out? They're not willing to really go, well, you know, we, we could fiddle with QE and bond purchase and so forth. No. If inflation expectations are anchored, they're anchored by one thing, and that is your and my and everybody else's belief that if inflation gets up to 10%, as in my red line, the Fed is willing to raise interest rates to 20% cause a massive recession that hurts, uh, hurts the disadvantage more than everybody else and bring inflation back down again. Uh, the only thing that makes sense to me anchoring by Fed tools is our belief that they're willing to do that again. Now that, are they willing to do that again? I think is something we should all be a little bit worried about. They're not willing to talk about it. They're not willing to, to you know, if you wanna threaten something, uh, make, make the threat sound, <laughs> sound loud. They're just, well, you know, we, we, there's something we can do about it. It's, it's a tool over here somewhere. Uh, no, you, you, we want us to believe they're willing to do something very painful if necessary to bring in play. That is what anchors expectations. Well, 
Uh, and it's going to be harder this time. It's gonna be harder this time for two reasons. First, in 1980, there was only 25% debt to GDP. Now we're at 100%. That means if the Fed, suppose the Fed raises interest rates to 5%, that will cause a trillion dollars of extra deficit. Can you imagine what Congress will say if the Fed says interest rates are 5%, and a trillion dollars of interest costs shows up on, on, the, on the balance sheet. Uh, our Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, has just assured us that all this borrowing is sustainable because interest costs are so low. Well, those interest costs are in the hands of the Federal Reserve. That, that will be very hard for the Fed to do. It'll be doubly hard for the Fed to do. The, the, now all the big banks are too big to fail. <laughs> if the Fed raises interest rates to 5%, all the big banks are underwater again. Hmm, uh, that's going to be hard for them to do. Uh, of course, we are in an, an era of, of great concern for unemployment, especially among the disadvantaged. Is the Fed, uh, with its louder and louder concern for inequality and, and so forth, really going to cause painful unemployment uh, among you know, workers and the rest of it? Uh, uh, and and uh, finally, you know, this is not this is not the political moment of, you know, this was the political moment of, of Ron Reagan. This took years too. It wasn't just a, a one-off thing. So uh, uh, it's going to be much harder for them to do it. So bottom line, yes, uh, today's price increases are potentially transitory. Uh, but the question is, uh, will this lead to expected inflation? When we look at the, the economics of that anchoring, it looks pretty ephemeral. So from the standpoint of conventional monetary economics, I think there is grounds to worry. Now, uh, you might say markets don't see inflation ahead. And I, I graphed to the 10 year treasury rate along with inflation. You can see interest rates. Uh, the interest rates have been on this amazing downward trend since 1980. They're now at 1.6%. Uh, the, the tiny part on the right, the blue is the interest rate, the red is inflation. So bond markets aren't acting as if they see inflation coming. But I put up the graph to remind you, bond markets never see inflation coming. <laughs> and watch in the 1970s. Did the, uh, did the 10 year treasury rate uh, in 1972 see the inflation of 1975 coming? No. Did in 1975 it see inflation going down? No. In 1978, did it see the inflation coming in 1980? No. In 1980, did it see the disinflation coming? No, throughout the 1980s, the bond market never believed the disinflation was permanent. So uh, don't trust the bond market to tell you whether inflation is coming or not. And there's a deep reason for it. So big conceptual that remember our, our, our number one formula, inflation equals expected inflation plus inflationary pressures. That means if anybody knew inflation was gonna be high tomorrow, inflation would already be high today. So uh, this is a theory that predicts the unpredictable. Uh, it tells us that inflation is very much like stock markets, like bank runs and so forth. It's inherently unpredictable. Uh, the fact that no one can tell you whether inflation will be high or low, least of all me, is proof that we understand that inflation is driven a lot by expected inflation. Uh, so I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, uh, say, I wouldn't sleep too much at night because the bond markets don't see inflation coming. Now, uh, what about quantitative easing and, and all this M2 and so forth? Uh, I put a graph here of, of the astounding things the Fed has done in the last uh, 10 years or so. They've bought a lot of stuff. Total Fed assets is, is all the stuff they've bought, of which here's treasuries. Now, the numbers, the numbers are small to see. These are big numbers on the left. Right now, the Fed has $8 trillion worth of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in its portfolio, corresponding to roughly $8 trillion of, of reserves. Uh, the Fed is just a huge money market fund. So, so banks are putting $8 trillion into the Fed and the Fed is, is holding $8 trillion worth of assets. And our, our monitors friends, I spent some time at the University of Chicago, look at this and say, oh my God, here comes the hyperinflation. Uh, the Fed is now buying two thirds of all treasury issues. Uh, so from that standpoint, it looks like the Fed is monetizing debt and, and you would worry a lot. Uh, here, uh, I would, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not worried, <clears throat> surprisingly. Um, I guess my time in Chicago didn't uh, rub off quite as much as it should. And the reason is, uh, I put a graph here for those of you who, who do uh, who remember your graphs from monetary economics. This is the demand and supply for, for reserves. Reserves are accounts banks have at the Fed. Uh, and uh, how it works is 
uh, banks, if there's not much reserves, they're willing to suffer an interest cost to hold reserves the way, you know, you need 10, 10 bucks in your wallet. But once we're into the 10, 10 billion dollars, the, 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 sorry, the $4 trillion of reserves, uh, banks are willing to hold any amount. This is like M&Ms. Do you want red M&Ms or green M&Ms? That eh, doesn't really matter uh, uh, which one. So reserves and treasuries are essentially perfect substitutes. Uh, and in fact, uh, everyone makes a big deal about QE. QE was these times when the Fed bought a lot of assets and issued a lot of reserves. And financial markets say, oh, huge effect. This is affecting interest rates. Well, let's go back and look at interest rates. 10-year interest rates have been on this glorious downward trend. Can you see any QE in this? QE is events that happened right around here. Interest rates look completely unaffected. Here, I'll, I'll advertise Jim Hamilton wrote, I think, one of the greatest papers on this, uh, just showing what seems perfectly obvious from the graph, that the QE really didn't have much effect on the way up, which means it won't have uh, much effect on the way down. What the Fed does is it changes the composition of government debt. Are, are you holding more treasuries or are you holding more reserves? And the qu deep question, sometimes that matters. Do you care about holding a money market fund that holds treasuries or do you care about holding uh, a money market fund that holds treasuries? The Fed is just a different name for a money market fund that holds treasuries. Sometimes, yes. Uh, I think in the current situation uh, of, of uh, perfect substitutes, um, no. Um, so um, that should make you, hopefully make you sleep a little. People will say, oh, M2 is so high and so forth. Well, uh, I don't think that matters that much uh, because here I made a little graph. Um, here's how it works. Here's people, you and me. We either through bank accounts hold reserves at the Fed and the Fed turns around and buys treasuries with it. Or uh, what we do is we take our money, we hold either treasuries directly or in mortgage-backed securities, or we put it into mutual funds that hold treasuries. If the Fed undoes its QE, what it will simply do is it sells some of its treasuries to these financial institutions who sell to us. So does it really matter whether we hold the 20, the, the 20 trillion dollars of treasury, the 25 trillion we're up to directly or through the Fed, through money market funds or through the Fed? Yeah, there's some little epsilons maybe, but my view is, is no, that's not what matters. What matters is the huge overall amount of debt. So here I graph debt relative to GDP. I didn't graph it. The Congressional Budget Office graphed this. For example, World War II, you can see we had a 100% debt to GDP ratio. That steadily declined, uh, built up in the 80s, then boom, uh, the, the stimulus of the Great Recession, boom, five trillion bucks uh, during the pandemic. And here is the CBO's forecast of where we go from there. Now, the CBO uh, is forecasting exploding debt. But the CBO's forecasts assume that nothing ever goes wrong again. So I put in sort of the, the grumpy economist forecast that recognizes every 10 years, we get a once in a hundred year flood. And the answer to that seems to be that the government will print money and send it to voters, uh, which it did here and here. And so we can forget my forecast of, of what goes on here. So does the composition of government debt does whether you're holding it to, as reserves or treasuries matter, or is it the overall amount of government debt that matters? Uh, I would vote for the overall amount of government debt as the thing to worry about. Would it really matter right now? There's all this money chasing all this, all this stuff. Good luck. I was trying to buy a bicycle yesterday. No luck. Uh, <laughs> would it really matter if the Fed says, okay, we're going to take all your money and we're going to give you money market fund shares instead? I would say no. But so here's, here's big conceptual framework number two. Inflation comes fundamentally not from which kind of government debt we hold, but when people lose faith, the government will be able to repay its debts. Worse, since our government chooses uh, to not only to borrow a huge amount, it borrows short term. Our government is like the family in 2006 who said, let's buy a house only 10% down. And then they say, shall we get the 30 year fixed or shall we get the adjustable rate with the, the adjustable with the teaser rate? They say, let's get the adjustable, it's even less. Well, the problem is if interest rates go up, then, uh, it, then, then you lose the house. That's the way our government borrows money, it borrows it short term. So uh, it's not just that people holding government bonds lose faith and try to dump those bonds. If, if people who hold the bonds today think that people who will buy them tomorrow people who roll over that debt tomorrow lose their faith, then boom, they try to dump the government debt. 
So that's the fundamental force for inflation. Uh, does, do people are people do people believe that our government will soak up all the debt in all its various forms uh, by by repaying its debts in the future? That this the CBO is not a forecast. The CBO is they're they're the grumpy CBO. This is this is what's going to happen if you guys don't do something about it. Uh, and, and they're very clear about the point of this is uh, is do something about it. Well, uh, I think we all bond markets, you and me, all think that this is the greatest country in the world, and that we're not going to run a debt crisis sooner or later. Uh, you know, our, our government's going to put its fiscal house in order. But at some point, they decided, and it's not debt itself is not the worry. The, you can borrow an enormous amount of money, as the U.S. did in World War II, if if investors think you have a plan for paying it off, which we did. We ran surpluses, primary surpluses, for two decades after World War II. Uh, they're, they're, the problem is debt versus a plan to pay it off. And the real worry is that our government does not right now have a plan uh, to pay it off. So the fundamental thing I worry about is not so much monetary machinations, not really Fed, but a, a grand, uh, if people say, look, this government is dysfunctional and they're not going to pay off their debts, we need to get out of bonds fast. That's the, the we're back to expected inflation. The expected inflation, I think, that is the, the really worrisome one is this loss of faith uh, in our debt, the loss of fiscal <clears throat> anchoring. Now, <clears throat> is that going to happen? I don't know. <clears throat> I've been worried about this for a long time. It hasn't happened yet. It's sort of like noticing that Californians live on earthquake faults. Uh, and our critics say, well, look, you haven't had an earthquake in 10 years. You guys must be full of it. Well, the earthquake fault, this is the earthquake fault. It is still there. Are these the events that are going to cause people to lose faith? Uh, I don't know but that's what I would look for if I'm worried about inflation. Let me, uh, my, my last set of thoughts goes that that's it for inflation. Um, a couple, a, a little bit on um, where is the Fed going more generally, the brave new Fed. And, and uh, when we think about the Fed in terms of interest rates, inflation, unemployment, uh, uh, monetary policy, we are missing uh, all of the iceberg that's under the water. Um, most of what is important about the Federal Reserve in today's economy is not monetary policy. It's broadly speaking what it does as the gargantuan financial regulator. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll point to three things that are going on right now and the larger trend of history. And, and, and I'm, I want to emphasize this because no one's talking about it. Well, few, few people are talking about it. It's, it's slow moving like icebergs, but it, it is, uh, I think, far more important in the long run. <clears throat> the first thing in the last year with the pandemic, uh, we saw a, a <clears throat> widespread, let's call them bailouts. Now, I don't mean to be uh, disparaging. Um, the Fed did something uh, quite wonderful. Uh, our, our government did, our government had the ability to spread $5 trillion around and did not, this pandemic could have turned into a spectacular financial crisis and recession. Uh, I was writing about this last March, lots of people were. Uh, we could have had a wave of bankruptcies, financial institutions closing, uh, businesses closing. Bankruptcies aren't necessarily bad, they're liquidations, they're reorganizations, but uh, in many cases, they, they destroy the businesses and there wouldn't be anything left to rebuild afterwards. That didn't happen. And it didn't happen because our government spread money around like crazy. And thank goodness it had the borrowing capacity to do it. What, when I really worry about this is that in the next crisis, our government goes to markets and says, I want $5 trillion to spread around in stimulus checks and bailouts. And the markets say, uh -uh, you're not getting it. And then we're like, we're like a, a, a town with a firehouse has burned down and we're in real trouble. But anyway, uh, you know, you put ex post, they did a wonderful thing, but let's look at what they did. In March, uh, the treasury market seized up. The US treasury could not sell bonds. The Fed jumped in and started buying bonds uh, and also bailed out the broker dealers who were supposed to do this and who didn't keep any cash around. So they weren't able to, to do their proper jobs. So the Fed started buying treasuries and set up a facility that the Fed is propping up the broker dealers. State and local governments, uh, uh, the Fed started buying new issues directly from state and local governments to keep the municipal bond market up. The money market funds nearly blew up. The Fed bailed out the money market funds again. 
Now, this happened in 2008. The first thing we said is we're going to regulation will fix this. We'll never bail out the money market funds again. Here we are, boom, bailed out the money market funds once again. This, uh, this is like compared to the hundreds of thousands of pages of Dodd-Frank Act, figuring out how money market funds don't need to bail out should take about five minutes. Boom, they got bailed out again. Corporate bonds. The Fed issued a Mario Draghi worthy, uh, will do what it takes and propped up the market price of corporate bonds. This isn't bailing out specific institutions. This is propping up the market price of an entire class of assets so that no investor ever loses money in it. PPP loans, the airlines got bailed out. Last time the big banks got, we didn't bail out the big banks, we did anything else. Stimulus checks to every person in the country, even people who had jobs or, or you know, perfectly, got, you know, government employees on pensions. Um, now, yes, uh, once again, uh, the Fed, uh, you know, we didn't have a horrible recession and uh, the Fed stopped that from happening. But you can't, this can't, now that we've done this twice, this is not just an expedient. This is a regime. This is, uh, this is where we are. We are in. Uh, why would you bother keeping um, extra cash around to buy in the, in the dip? Why would you bother not, why would you not borrow like crazy knowing that the Fed's going to come to the rescue in the, next, uh, in the next one? That's what we call moral hazard. We have a new, uh, a, a new regime. Prices may not go down. Creditors may not lose money in any, in any bad event. So why would you not borrow like crazy? We call this moral hazard. Now, in the event is a bad time to think about moral hazard. Uh, in the event, you bail out like crazy and you make promises that we won't let this happen next time. And last time, at least in 2008, our government had the decency to say we're bailing out right, left and center. Uh, we're doing all this stuff, but we're going to have a Dodd-Frank Act and make sure it doesn't happen again. Those promises all got broken, but at least we had the decency to make them. No one's talking about this now. So we are firmly in the regime that everybody expects uh, that every time something goes wrong, the government, the Fed and the government will come and, and prop up all the losses. Therefore, you know, you have a big firehouse, keep the gas in the basement, no need to buy fire extinguishers. The firemen will always come. Well, we'll see if they come next time. The Fed has moved on uh, to worry about climate change and inequality. Uh, and, and the Fed is behind other central banks, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, they are way ahead of us on this. They are, uh, and where we're going is to uh, force companies to uh, disclose uh, climate risks, risks to the financial system due to climate change. Uh, we're gonna go on to stress tests. So we're going to uh, have climate risk stress tests. Now I am uh, as much, I worry about the climate and environmental issues as much as the rest of you. Climate change is real. Uh, climate change will happen. We need to do something about it, but this is crazy. Um, the uh, Financial regulation and banking, we can look five, we can look maybe 10 years ahead. If you read the actual science on climate, the chances of a change in climate that, uh, not own, that causes wide, such widespread losses that brings down the US financial system within the next five to 10 years, is, this is just not in any science anywhere. Uh, you can repeat it over and over again, but there's no, yes, there will be floods, there will be hurricanes. Duh, people in insurance companies know that there will be floods and hurricanes. We're not talking about floods and hurricanes. We're talking about such a drastic shift in the climate that it brings down all the big banks. Even the biggest floods and hurricanes have very little effect on the US economy. This is one of the paradoxes of climate, uh, that, that they have very little effect on actual financial system. Indeed, now the second one is, oh, well, it's not really not a climate. We have to worry that regulators will, uh, will, so, uh, will, will shock the system so much that it brings it down. Again, uh, you know, this is kind of the, the Don Corleone version. Mm, nice little business you have there. It would be a shame if something should happen to it. The danger isn't the climate, the danger is the regulators. I, not even I think our regulators are, are that, that crazy. What this really is, is an effort to, to use central banks to impose a particular climate policy that has no chance of getting passed uh, through regular means, even the EPA won't do it, to defund current US fossil fuels uh, before we have alternatives ready, to subsidize particular uh, alternatives, uh, not, for example, nuclear power, um, carbon capture, geoengineering, things that, that might actually work. Uh, 
And I worry about it for two reasons. One, the climate. This will not help the climate one bit. Uh, the Russians are building, uh, the Chinese are building coal plants and the Russians are building pipelines no matter what we do. Uh, it, it diverts attention away from genuine ways of fixing the climate. And it requires financial institutions to lie, to come up with phony climate risks to please the regulators. And then, uh, then we've ruined financial regulation. I worry about financial regulation too. Uh, so this is a, a very dangerous uh, um, misuse of the Federal Reserve's uh, power to, to promote a different political agenda. It also distracts the Fed from actual risks. There are risks out there. For example, 10 years of stress tests never considered, oh, there might be a pandemic. We just saw one of the greatest failures ever. They asked banks, think about all the risks you might have, even though there were 12 pandemic preparedness plans sitting on federal government shelves, no one ever thought, oh, what if a pandemic comes? Well, you know what? Another pandemic might come. It's gonna come a lot more soon than the oceans will rise and, and, and the floods and heat will come. Um, nuclear war might break out. Um, cyber attacks might break out. There's all sorts of risks to the financial system that we are ignoring uh, here. The Fed is going on to take on inequality, social justice, racial justice issues, and its tools here are its massive regulatory powers uh, to tell banks uh, who to lend and, and how to run their businesses. Um, now, how did this happen? How did the Fed move from interest rates and making sure your bank isn't going to fail, making sure the banking system isn't going to fail? Uh, this is a case of giving a two-year-old a hammer, and then suddenly everything looks like a nail. Uh, we, the Fed now says, oh, there's a risk to the financial system. Uh, how is it that, that the Fed has the authority to monitor risks to the financial system and to decree that corporate bonds falling in price is a risk to the financial system and nobody can lose money on corporate bonds? Where did that come from? <laughs> That's not the, traditionally the Fed's job. How does the Fed tell banks where to lend and where not? How does the Fed buy assets and the European Central Bank's way ahead. They're buying green bonds that they regard as underpriced. They're directly subsidizing some kinds of investments and not others. Well, this comes from the fateful choice made in 2008. We had a financial crisis and there was two ways to go about fixing it. One is to recognize all financial crises are runs on short-term debt. So get rid of the short-term debt in the system so that people can lose money without the financial system falling down and then let people lose money because uh, if, if a stock falls, the investors lose money, they go home, they might have a double whiskey and kick the dog, but you don't bring down the financial system if a stock loses money. When a bank loses money, uh, the financial system is in danger because each of us can run and try to get our money out before the next guy. Well, get rid of that short-term debt, that run-prone element of the financial system. That's one way to handle it. The Fed went to the other way uh, for a lot of uh, largely political reasons, which is we'll allow all the short-term debt in, but we'll pretend that us regulators can look and make sure that you never lose money again. Uh, and that's the fateful choice that was made. Give the Fed much, much more power to tell banks and other financial institutions uh, where they may invest. And the Fed took this on to we're, we're going to take the second step that, that we didn't actually take in 2008 and, and prop up prices in financial markets so that nobody loses money so that there isn't a run. Well, that was a fateful choice. Uh, the choice, uh, even QE, well, well, we'll buy assets to keep the prices up a little bit. QE now turns into, uh, we'll buy assets because we think, uh, you know, it has turned into this in Europe already and the Fed is heading there. We'll buy assets of, of, um, of uh, unprofitable uh, green energy, uh, uh, green energy uh, uh, things, which, which is a fine thing for the treasury to do using taxpayers' money, but not, not under, uh, under the cover of the Fed. So that's uh, where this came from is the classic case of the two-year-old with a hammer. Now everything looks like a nail. And why is this dangerous? Um, you, you may think all these policies are great, but the Federal Reserve is an independent agency. It's allowed to do, it has enormous power uh, to print money, hand it out, uh, to, to uh, buy bonds, to change, to, to, yeah, there's nothing more politically sensitive than money, and the Fed can decide who gains and who loses. In a democracy, you get independent action 
uh, you're, you're protected from political uh, influence only if you agree to a limited domain. And that used to be, the, the Fed's deal was, we're very independent, but we only deal with interest rates and inflation and unemployment. We're not doing politically charged things like climate change and racial and social justice. Therefore, we can be independent of the administration. Uh, we're gonna lose that. The Fed, if the Fed takes on these kinds of challenges and we're, we're headlong in that direction, then it must be political, politically accountable as, as the treasury is. And that would be too bad. An independent central bank is another wonderful thing that, that was invented in the last uh, century and, and will, will disappear quickly uh, as it does this sort of stuff the minute there's a change in, in political winds. With that, uh, time for me to shut up and you to ask some questions. That was a great talk, John. Uh, I think next time I'm supposed to teach my students about what happened in the 1970s, rather than making them listen to why, my boring lecture, I just played a video of, of what you just said. Uh, we'll move to questions now. <clears throat> and if you have questions or comments, uh, please use the chat button and we'll call on you. Uh, let me start it off with a question of my own, John. If I can ask you to put on your, your hat as former president of the American Finance Association. Uh, suppose I'm a personal investor or a financial advisor or portfolio manager. I hadn't really been thinking or worrying about any of these issues till you talked. And now I say, oh, you convinced me totally. I believe everything you said. Uh, how, in terms of practical investment strategy, does what you say translate into what I should do? Ah, uh, well, here I, I have to... <laughs> There's two hats, my worry about everything hat and, and my uh, efficient markets uh, hat. The problem is, of course, uh, uh, you have to beat everyone else. To, to beat the market, uh, you have to be smarter than everybody else because, um, you know, ideally, the, the, if everybody knows something bad is happening, uh, they, they have already driven the prices up or down to where you can't, uh, can't change it. Uh, so my, my basic portfolio advice is always, uh, diversified low cost portfolio. Don't try to be too smart because uh, you have to be smarter than the next guy. For every winner, there's a loser. Uh, but I also, uh, you know, certain amount of risk management. So um, don't, um, many investors are, are secretly very overexposed to one thing or another thing. So make sure, um, you know, that, you're, you're, that if some inflation breaks out, you won't be bankrupt. Um, and, and otherwise don't try to be too smart. Sorry, that's it for portfolio advice. <laughs> I have another, uh, you, we could have given another talk. I do have a paper that I'll advertise. This is all, everything I've done today, by the way, is written down, which you'll find on the Grumpy Economist blog mostly. But there's portfolios for long-term investors that basically says, uh, hold the market and hope for the best. <laughs> well, thanks. We'd love to have you down for that as well. Uh, and now uh, let's get some questions from the participants. Uh, let's start with Aaron. If you would, Aaron, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly to John. And after that, we'll go to Anthony Hidalgo. Okay, great. Sorry. I, let me uh, uh, put on my video. Uh, um, my, uh, thank you for the talk, sir. Um, that, was, that was great. My, my question is, don't you miss um, sort of the, the massive shift in financialization that's happened within not just the United States economy, but globally, but but the let's say the the intensity or the density of that financialization in the U.S. economy and and the and the way that the dollar mixed with the sort of cash machine that we wind up having in the United States, right? I mean, we have just massive savings, massive corporate cash, and there's a massive financialization that's wrapped around that with a massive securitization market, and so that that's. Um, that that winds up being kind of its own ecology, that then basically the Fed operates really almost on like two tracks, like the normal Fed of the old days, and then this sort of new Fed that works inside this other ecology, because everybody's not going to go grab their, you know, their, their 75 or 100 trillion of assets and sell them all and, and do what with them, because it would transform the dollar, right? So we're not going to touch that. We're only going to touch a small percentage of that every year, and that the Fed and the, the Fed basically just taps that whenever you have one of these systemic crises. Now, I'm not arguing that that fits macroprudential textbook work, but I guess I'm saying, isn't that what they're really doing? So, really, I, I think you're you're right. The economy has become 
financialized. Uh, and, and that's a great and good thing. <laughs> the, the, um, the sand and the gears between your and my savings and, and corporate investment uh, leads to more and more efficient corporate investment. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm a big fan of repurchases. <laughs> that's been a way of getting money out of corporations that don't have any good ideas into your hands, and then you give it to companies that have better ideas. Uh, so financialization, by and large, we should we should celebrate. It also, I think, however, means the Federal Reserve is much less powerful than it used to be. Uh, much as I, I drew that flat line with with the reserves, um, uh, it, it used to be the the Fed uh, could restrict corporate uh, restrict lending to corporations via the banking system. So companies had to borrow from banks, and if the Fed makes reserve requirements higher, then it's harder for banks to lend to companies. And so monetary policy could affect the economy. Now the Fed tries to do that and the companies say, Puh, so what, I'll issue commercial paper, I'll float some corporate debt, uh, I'll, I'll go to the European banks. So the Fed actually is much less powerful uh, in, its, in its direct effects on the financial system, which is in part why the size of the bombs, it's, you know, it used to move reserves by, by a couple of billion dollars and everyone goes nuts. Now, $4 trillion of reserves and nobody even barely seems to notice it. So the number one thing I'd say I would say about the financialization, and partly also, where as the Fed regulates the big banks, uh, which uh, then uh, things move outside the big banks, which is perhaps a good thing. Um, uh, you know, so we have a financial to the extent that it's it's serving the economic function as opposed to just getting around regulations. It it can be a, a good thing. Uh, you point to the dollar. I wouldn't count on. So we have this exorbitant privilege that in, ensures us from inflation, lets us borrow because people like dollars, but there's a limited amount of that. So, so you, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple trillion and a couple basis points for that. But if you try to finance $30 trillion of uh, Green New Deal uh, off of everybody loves the dollar, uh, they'll discover that they might love the Swiss franc a lot more. And, and collectively they can't, but individually they can try and that will send the dollar down. Great. Uh, next up, uh, Anthony. Thank you. John, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, do you see any additional inflation risk uh, from the rise of crypto? Um, no. <laughs> uh, crypt crypto is right now mostly enabling piracy, which is what we ought to call it. Uh, uh, but it's not a, uh, it's not a substitute medium of exchange, transactions medium, uh, and, and so forth. So I, I don't think it really has that much to do with monetary affairs. It's very inefficient for making transactions. It's, it's very volatile. So it's its own thing. Um, uh, now we need better electronic money. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a deep problem that our government has to face in providing, in allowing electronic money. Uh, first, let's get rid of the credit card interchange fees like you know any normal country has done. But uh, there's this trade-off of anonymity versus uh, efficiency. And um, you know, people want the anonymity of crypto. That's what it's really about. Now, some of them for good reasons, some, a lot of them for bad reasons. Cash is anonymous. And uh, so there is a challenge, which is creating a good digital dollar, which requires figuring out how much anonymity, how much privacy uh, you get. But uh, I don't see crypto as, as a, a challenge to standard monetary economics for a long time. Just a reminder, we'll be getting into that topic in a lot more detail on September 7th with uh, uh, Linda Schilling. Let's go on now to uh, Dick Harris. Thank you, and thanks, John. Uh, excellent talk and appreciate your comments. A question, when we talk about inflation being transitory, or we, do, you, do you anticipate prices coming back down or the price increases moderating? Is this a new elasticity of demand that, that we've not previously thought was there in some of these prices? And now you know, the, the price for a two by four is now six bucks instead of a dollar fifty? Or... I think the general feeling is that uh... Uh, the hope, so, you know, the, the, what the Fed hopes is that this is a one-time price increase that stays higher, not that it's a price increase that will be reversed. Uh, so we will not have deflation corresponding to this inflation to bring prices back to where they were, but rather we'll just move to a, a new higher level. And that's the best scenario they're, they're, they're offering. Uh, and, and my guess is that's probably right. 
Thanks, and uh, Robert has a two-pronged question. Oh yes, uh, very helpful comments. I have been reading your, your blog too, and very interesting comments about growth and inflation. Thank you. Uh, curious about velocity, the very low uh, money velocity. Is, uh, is that something that matters? That's the first part of the question. And uh, what would you look for for a change in expectations? Um, so money velocity does not matter uh, because money doesn't matter anymore. We are deep, deep into the realm. So money is about the composition of government debt, not, not the total amount. Right now, our reserves and treasuries pay essentially exactly the same interest rate. And so banks are really indifferent uh, up to little regulatory issues about capital charges and so forth. Uh, banks are really indifferent whether they hold reserves at the Fed or hold short-term treasuries. So uh, velocity is, um, for the rest of you guys, uh, velocity is, is nominal GDP income divided by money. Let's make uh, reserves at the Fed one class of financial assets. Uh, but now when, when people don't care about money versus treasuries, dividing by one versus dividing by the other doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's, it's your overall calories. Velocity is calories divided by the number of red M&Ms you eat. Well, substituting red M&Ms for green M&Ms changes velocity a lot, but I'm sorry to tell you, it isn't gonna do anything for your diet. And that's the situation we're in. And that's why I, I don't think uh, monetary aggregates are much of a guide at all to inflation. Again, because monetary aggregates about what kind of government debt do you hold? What, how, do you how many red M&Ms are you eating? As opposed to the overall quantity of government debt, how much M&Ms are, are you eating? Uh, so that it, it might've been in a different world, but, but not in today's world anymore. Okay, we have time, I think, for one more question uh, from Aaron again. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, my my question is that you know we we made a big um, switch in the early two thousands off of the thirty year uh, treasury, which I, I just could never understand. I mean, I thought that was one of the weirdest things I've seen in the last twenty five years uh, in economics. Um, and, uh, you know, there really was never much discussion about it. I mean, obviously, I think it was an assumption that we could just issue whenever we want to, whatever we want to, um, that there was sort of a, you know, it sort of got in the way of treasury operations and, and so on. But I think today, if you had the 30 year, or if you created a, you know, a 40 or 50 year structure that becomes basically balance sheet, balance sheet driven, especially in, in, in systemic risk organizations, you could really change some of the uh, debt reissue risk uh, that I think most people are worried about, right? I mean, if, if we were sitting on a, a, you know, a majority of this at 30 years, would people really be as concerned about you know, the ability to find buyers on, a, on, a, on an annualized basis? I, I think that risk would go down a lot. I mean, what's your, what's your take on just sort of recreating that conversation on a longer term structure? Uh, given how financialized we are, uh, how systemically regulated we are, you can just sort of force enough institutions to just, you know, soak up a certain X percentage of their debt as collateralization. Um, it might not be fair, but um, it's a tool, basically. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll advertise a whole essay on this I've written called The New Structure of Federal Debt. Let's keep going. Perpetuities. Uh, why shouldn't the U.S. government issue uh, perpetual debt with no maturity? You just buy it back when, when the day comes that they want to reduce the, de the debt, just buy it back. Perpetual debt has a great advantage that uh, there is one QCIP, it's one security, so it's immensely more liquid than rolling amounts of 30-year debt. Uh, the deeper question is the U.S. has borrowed very short term. Uh, the U.S. has chosen, like I, I said, I made the joke about the, the, the couple buying a house, who uh, gets the, uh, the adjustable rate mortgage, not the 30 year fixed. The US made a, has continues to make a strategic decision to uh, roll over short-term debt. The danger being if interest rates go up, then the deficit, the debt costs uh, skyrocket and we are in danger. All financial crises are crises of short-term debt, Enable, unable to roll over short-term debt or uh, interest rates rising, feeding through on the budget. If we borrowed long-term, 30-year, 50-year, 
best of all perpetuities, the US would insulate itself from the chance of this kind of uh, debt, sudden debt inflation crisis for a generation. Why don't they do it? Because it would uh, cost another, you know, you buy insurance, you pay a premium. And we are choosing not, it's like a house, it's like not buying fire insurance. Well, so long as there is no fire, it's, it's you know, we saved the premium. Uh, and, and I've watched these decisions be made and it's been explicit. Well, we could borrow long-term, but that would cost us another 50 basis or points or so and wouldn't look good in the budget calculations. So we're gonna borrow real short-term and pray that interest rates never go up. Uh, but, but not by, especially now, with 100% debt to GDP set to explode, we're, we're gonna try modern monetary theory for all it's worth. Not buying that insurance is almost criminal. So uh, absolutely, um, not only issue better kinds of long-term debt, but, but fund it long-term, engage in swaps, uh, buy, if we're gonna try this big experiment, at least buy some insurance so we don't subject to the US to a, a debt crisis of unimaginable proportions if it all goes wrong. Thanks, thanks, John. I knew this was going to be a great talk, and it surely was. Um, and uh, I promised we'd end on time, so we will. But I know there's some more of you that want to ask some questions. So uh, let me invite you to stay on if you want for a little more freewheeling conversation and uh, come back again on uh, September 7th. So uh, I always love your presentation, John, and, and thanks so much. Well, thank you all for, thank you all for being here and for great questions. Let me first see if I can figure out how to stop the recording. Here we go.